teams did a great job. Um, Going to reveal a little more about the case now. Kind of exciting. This is how things normally go. Uh, information comes in slowly. You've already seen this. This is our 26 year old woman. Headache, inability to communicate, behavioral changes, abnormal movements. You already know how quickly things deteriorated, seizing, and then became unresponsive to all stimuli. Okay, what's going on? Well, um, in thinking about this case, the physician will consider how focal is it, how asymmetric is it, how widespread is it. And the first thing you note here is how widespread and symmetrical the changes are. And that argues against a stroke, which tends to be more focal or what we call a lateralizing. Uh, eye deviation uh, to one side, not the other. Focal lesion or injury, not too well supported here. The other interesting thing, in addition to the symmetry, uh, it was not, it was, it was somewhat fluctuating, uh, but uh, rapidly uh, progressive, okay? And so this, uh, the, the fact that it was symmetric also argued against very aggressive focal cancers, focal demyelination, focal vascular or blood supply issues. But a lot of very destructive, progressive things wouldn't uh, fluctuate that way. They wouldn't uh, 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 restore function. Uh, spontaneous way, even superimposed on an overall deterioration. So it was thought that demyelination, vascular, and aggressive cancers were not likely to be involved. If you look at the combination of behavioral and memory problems, that points to the so-called limbic system, which is a part of the brain that uh, controls memory, including the hippocampus. This is also a part of the brain that, has the, that is most seizure prone, and we know she had uh, uh, at least one seizure in the hospital. But the confusing thing was other signs pointed away from the, the hippocampus and toward the brain stem. There were uh, changes in mood and uh, autonomic abnormalities and she became completely unresponsive. So it wasn't just memory, it was very global. So we had this uh, uh, very widespread uh, uh, picture. Okay, so that was a little more in terms of clinical thinking. What about lab tests? Toxicology was interesting. There was barbiturate positivity, there was THC, there was alcohol, okay. But none of these by themselves explained the symptoms. Negative for Lyme, negative for syphilis, heavy metals, negative. Cultures of blood and sputum, negative. Urine only showed yeast, nothing serious. Antibiotics were given, proved the yeast, but nothing else helped, okay. More diagnostics. MRI scan of the brain, everybody's curious about that, right? Looked basically normal. Nothing that could really be picked up. Mild sinus issues. CT of the brain, no intracranial hemorrhage, no tumor that you could pick up. Uh, normal blood supply, carotids, vertebrals, and cerebral arteries. CT angiography is filling the blood vessels with a contrast eye so you can see the form of all the blood vessels. Chest x ray, basically normal. There's what we call focal consolidation, which means sometimes people who are hospitalized for a while will get a slight collapse of part of the lung. That's called atelectasis. It can look a little bit like pneumonia. In any case, that can be treated. Uh, could not explain the symptoms. Nothing serious on x-ray. EEG, uh, diffuse slowing. We see this sometimes on EEG. It's not very helpful in diagnosing, but it shows there is a problem in the brain, but we knew that already, um, so not a huge help. But there was not as if there was an ongoing seizure activity. Sometimes that happens, we call that status epilepticus, where there's always a seizure going on all the time and you can become unresponsive for that reason. She had a seizure, but not ongoing seizures. So that did not explain her, her symptoms. Echocardiography, transthoracic, using ultrasound to look at the heart. Why'd they do that? Well, it was normal, so it doesn't matter, but I'll tell you sometimes People who have strokes, they, there can be abnormalities in the heart. There can be a clot or a thrombus that's throwing off particles that ends up clotting bus, this, uh, blood vessels in the brain. Not the case here, totally normal. Okay, then some things were seen, okay. Out of left field, CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, okay, revealed a lesion. A 1.6 centimeter lesion in the left ovary that contained fat and calcifications consistent with what's called a dermoid cyst. Okay, so then bring an ultrasound of the pelvis. It's hyperechogenic, which means it shows up very well on ultrasound. Um, fat and calcification, consistent with a dermoid cyst. I'll tell you more about what that is in a minute. 
Okay, blood tests of a whole bunch of things. Almost everything normal. A uh, lot of things that could go wrong. Copper, heavy metal, thyroid, all normal. Voltage-gated potassium channel antibodies, normal. Nothing seen there. Uh, antibodies to some antineuronal things, analogous to what we've talked about before, normal. But lumbar puncture, looking at the cerebral spinal fluid, which you can access here, but it's the same fluid that's circulating here, showed a few interesting things. Pleocytosis, cells. Normally there's not a lot of cells in cerebral spinal fluid, but there are cells. And here, antibodies to the NMDA receptor. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. What's going on there? And this is just what some of the imaging looks like, ultrasound of the pelvis showing this little hyper echogenic region. So, okay, so you go in, you take a look at it, and the reason you are suspicious now is there's a syndrome called limbic encephalitis, which is paraneoplastic. That means it occurs in the setting of a neoplasm or cancer. This happens, it's like the small cell lung cancer that we talked about earlier that can lead to the production of antibodies. You can actually have a non-neural tumor that ends up <coughs> making a protein that the immune system's not used to seeing there in that location and ends up creating an uh, immune response too, and it creates an autoimmune attack. And so in her dermoid cyst, she had all kinds of different stuff going on. There, were, there was neural tissue, a little bit of neuroepithelial tissue. There was fat, there was cartilage as shown in blue. So this is, a, it, particularly in the ovary, in these uh, reproductive uh, zones of the body, there's a particular plasticity. You can actually create tumors spontaneously that make tissues corresponding to many different parts of the body, including uh, the nervous system. And so she had a dermoid cyst that was making tissues corresponding to all different parts of the body, including neural tissue, and therefore including NMDA receptors, and the immune system then created antibodies to uh, the receptor. What does that do? Well, then you've got antibodies that manage to leak their way into the hippocampus, uh, into the CNS overall. That explains the sort of symmetric global effect, uh, both brainstem, limbic system. Uh, seizure probably originated here. You could actually see uh, staining for antibodies to the NMDA receptor using the patient's uh, serum. You can get different kinds of things. It's, it's not always an NMDA receptor antibody. Sometimes it's potassium channels. Sometimes it's other neural targets. Um, but in her case, it was an NMDA receptor finding. And so the diagnosis then is limbic encephalitis. This fits every part of her diagnosis and course in a, in a perfect way. Um, if you're interested, there was a really recent book called uh, Brain on Fire, which is a, some of you might have heard about. It got a lot of uh, press a, a year or so ago. It was written by somebody who had one of these syndromes, and she actually describes the psychosis that she was experiencing. I'm really uh, uh, psychotic as a result of this uh, NMDA receptor-dependent limbic encephalitis. The course of it is you have a severe headache, uh, neck pain, malaise. It can look like meningitis, often in young women. You get mood changes, then serious thought disorder, disordered thinking, incomprehensible speech, confusion, hallucinations, then seizures, decreasing consciousness. You can have this sort of unresponsive state that the patient had. In psychiatry, we call it catatonia. Neurologists call it akinetic mutism. It's the same thing. You get increased muscle tone, increased activity overall, facial dyskinesias, abnormal movements, everything's being activated abnormally. NMDA receptor being driven in some cases by some antibodies, so you actually can actually open the channel and allow ions to flow through. It's not just that it's dysfunctional, it can be hyperfunctional. Without treatment, you get respiratory failure and death. EEG was consistent, that diffuse slowing uh, was, was consistent. MRI and CT looking normal is completely expected as well because you can't see these anomalies. Root cause, it's, it's like a cancer. It's a, the dermoid cyst was the initial thing and that was a, a proliferation that's, that's cancer-like. Hyperproliferation. And the, in this case, the uh, lumbar puncture was very extreme. So anti-NMD receptor antibody needed perineoplastic limbic encephalitis associated with ovarian carcinoma. So actually, uh, one, of, one of the groups actually had that on their differential, which is pretty impressive. But the reason we picked this as an initial uh, case was uh, it, it kind of shows how you need to look at the whole body together. I mean, who would have thought that there was 
you know, assist in the ovary based on this patient's uh, CNS findings. So it shows how everything's interrelated. It highlights immune, cancer, CNS function. So your task next is uh, to think about possible treatments, okay? Think about the antibody, think about the immune system, think about the cyst, uh, how you would treat it. Uh, and uh, again, simple, short, uh, uh, try to hit the heart of the matter. It may not be as simple as you might think, uh, but uh, uh, and then we'll tell you what happened with this patient and how treatment uh, and response progressed. Okay, any questions on that? I, I would say, you know, you're going to have not just one thing, you're going to have a list of uh, possible treatments, and I would give a justification for each one, and a little bit maybe on the sequencing, you know, we would do yeah. this first, uh, and then based on that we would do this, okay? Again, one sentence, a little bit of justification for each intervention that you might do. All right, great. <laughs>